And hello again from Fox News in Washington. Today from the White House, we're on the president's patio just outside the Oval Office. President Trump, you've agreed to answer all manner of questions. No subject off limits. Thank you. And welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Thank you very much. Let's start with the surge of the coronavirus across the country in recent months. You still talk about it as, quote, burning embers. But I want to put up a chart that shows where we are with the illness over the last four months. As you can see, we hit a peak here in April, 36,000 cases. It's cases. A day. Yeah, cases. Then, then it went down, and now since June, it has gone up, more than doubled. One day this week, 75,000 right. new cases, more than double. Chris, that's the because old we have great testing, because we have the best testing in the world. If we didn't test, you wouldn't be able to show that chart. If we tested half as much, those numbers would be down. But, but this tested, isn't burning embers, sir. This is a forest no, no, fire. But I don't say. I say flames. We'll put out the flames, and we'll put out, in some cases, just burning embers. We also have burning embers. We have embers, and we do have flames. Florida became more flame-like, but it's uh, it's going to be under control. And, you know, it's not just this country. It's many countries. We don't talk about it in the news. They don't talk about Mexico and Brazil and still parts of Europe, which actually got hit sooner than us. So it's a little ahead of us in that sense. But you take a look. Why don't they talk about Mexico, which is not helping us? And all I can say is, thank God I built most of the wall, because if I didn't have the wall up, we would have a much bigger problem with Mexico. But, sir, we have the seventh highest mortality rate in the world. Our mortality rate is higher than Brazil. It's higher than Russia. And the European Union has us on a travel ban. Yeah, I think what we'll do, well, we have them on a travel ban too, Chris. I closed them off. If you remember, I was the one that did the European Union very early. But when you talk about mortality rates, I think it's the opposite. I think we have one of the lowest mortality it's rates true, in the sir. world. We, well, we, we're going to we take a, a look. We had 900 deaths on a single day. We will this, take a look. This week. Ready? I, you you well, can check you it out. Could you please get me the mortality rate? Yeah. Kaylee's right here. I heard we have one of the lowest, maybe the lowest mortality I, rate anywhere in the world. Do you have the numbers, please? <laughs> because I heard we had the best mortality rate. Number number one low mortality rate. Yeah, I hope you show the scenario because it shows what fake news is all about. Okay, okay go I ahead. don't think I'm fake news, but okay. I will we'll put well, our there you are. we'll put our stats you on. You said we had the worst mortality rate in the world, I and we have the best. The all right, it's a little complicated, rate. but bear with us. We went with numbers from Johns Hopkins University, which charted the mortality rate for 20 countries hit by the virus. The U.S. ranked seventh, better than the United Kingdom, but worse than Brazil and Russia. The White House went with this chart from the European CDC, which shows Italy and Spain doing worse, but countries like Brazil and South Korea doing better. Other countries doing better, like Russia, aren't included in the White House chart. California, locking down again. Florida deadliest day of the entire pandemic. Uh, hospitals at capacity in a number of places around the country, shortages of testing, shortages of personal protective equipment for nurses and doctors. A lot of people say this is because we don't have a national plan. You talk about states. We don't have a national plan. Do you take responsibility for that? Look, I take responsibility always for everything because it's ultimately my job too. I have to get everybody in line. Some governors have done well, some governors have done poorly. They're supposed to have supplies. They didn't have, I supplied everybody. Now we have somewhat of a surge in certain areas and in other areas we're doing great, but we have a surge in certain areas. But you don't hear people complaining about ventilators. We've got all the ventilators we can use. We're supplying them to other countries. We go out into parking lots and everything. Everybody gets a test. We find if we did half the testing, with all of that being said, I'm glad we did it. This is the right way to do it. I'm glad we did what we're doing. But we have more tests by far than any country in the world. But, sir, testing is up 37 percent. Well, that's 30, good. I understand. Cases are up 194 percent. It isn't just the testing has gone up. It's that the virus has spread. The positivity rate has increased. There, many the, the of virus those is cases, worse than it was. Many of those cases are young people that would heal in a day. They have the sniffles, and we put it down as a test. Many of them. Don't forget, I guess it's like 99.7 percent. People are going to get better. And in many cases, they're going to get better very quickly. We go out and we look, and then on the news, look, if you go back to the news, all of your, even your wonderful competitors, 
you'll see cases are up. Well, cases are up. Many of those cases shouldn't even be cases. Cases are up because we have the best testing in the world, and we have the most I, testing. I, I, no I, country I, has ever done what we've done in terms of testing. We are the envy of the world, they call, and they say the most incredible job anybody's done is our job on testing, because we're going to very shortly be up to 50 million tests. You look at other countries, they don't even do tests. They do tests if somebody walks into the hospital, they're sick. They're really sick. They test them then, or they'll test them in a doctor's office. But they don't go around and have massive areas of testing, and we do. And I'm glad we do, but it really skews the numbers. I'm going to do you a favor, because I'm sure a lot of people listening right now are going to say, Trump, he tries to play it down. He tries to I make it not play, seem I'm as not serious as it is. A, no, this when is you very see serious. 75,000 cases a day. Show me the death chart. Well, well, I don't have the death well, chart. The death here, but chart is but much I can more tell important. You, the death chart is a thousand cases a day. Excuse me. It's all too much. It shouldn't be one case. It came from China. They should have never let it escape. They should have never let it out. But it is what it is. Take a look at Europe. Take a look at the numbers in Europe. And by the way, I they're tell having you, cases surges. Are, are 6,000 in the whole European Union. They don't test. They don't test like we test. Is it we possible test. that they don't have the virus as badly no, as we do? No, it's possible that they don't test. That's what's possible. We find cases, and many of those cases heal automatically. We're finding, in a way, we're creating trouble. We're certainly, we're creating trouble for the fake news to come along and say, oh, we have more cases. Look, we did something that nobody's ever done. Not only the ventilators, where we're supplying them all over the world. We did a testing program, the likes of which nobody's ever done before. The head of the CDC, Dr. Redfield, said this on Tuesday. I do think the fall and the winter of 2020 and 2021 are going to be the, probably one of the most difficult times that we've experienced in American public health. Do you agree with Dr. Redfield? I don't know, and I don't think he knows. I don't think anybody knows with this. This is a very tricky deal. Uh, everybody thought the summer it would go away and it would come back in the fall. Well, in the summer it came. They used to say the heat. The heat was good for it, and it really knocks it out, remember? And then it might come back in the fall. So they got that one wrong. They, they got a lot wrong. They got a lot wrong. The World Health got a tremendous amount wrong. They basically did whatever China wanted them to uh, and will save now almost $500 million a year, which is nice. But the World Health got a lot wrong. But this is one of the sharpest criticisms of you. I agree. People say that you talk about the world as you'd like to see it rather than follow the signs. No, I... Well, let me, let me just ask the question, sir. Why on earth would your administration be involved in a campaign at this point to discredit Dr. Fauci, who is the nation's top infectious disease expert? Because we're not. If one man from my administration doesn't like him because he made a few mistakes. Look, Dr. Fauci said, don't wear a mask. Dr. Fauci told me not to ban China. It would be a big mistake. I did it over and above his recommendation. Dr. Fauci then said, you saved tens of thousands of lives, more than that. He said, you saved tens of thousands of lives. Dr. Fauci has made some mistakes, but I have a very good, I spoke to him yesterday at length. I have a very good relationship with Dr. Fauci. But, but sir, this week, this weekend, your White House put out a series of statements, so-called mistakes that Dr. Fauci has, had made. One of your closest aides, one of your right-hand men, Daniel, Daniel Scavina, put out this. <laughs> have you seen this? Well, this doctor, look, doctor, Dr. Look. Fawcett, it shows him as a leaker and an alarmist. Oh, I don't know that why, he's a leaker. Why would he's a little that? bit of an alarmist. That's okay. A little bit he's of an alarmist. He's a bit of an, I'm an alarmist. A little bit of an alarmist. Let me just say, Dr. Fauci at the beginning, and again, I have a great relationship with him. I spoke to him at length yesterday. Dr. Fauci at the beginning said, this will pass. Don't worry about it. This will pass. He was wrong. Dr. Fauci said, don't ban China. Don't ban China. I did. He then admitted that I was but right. But you made mistakes, too. I guess everybody makes. I was going to say, you said at one point. It's one person coming in from China, and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. When you have 15 people, and the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero, uh, that's a pretty good job we've done. I think we're going to be very good with the coronavirus. I think that at some point, uh, that's going to sort of just disappear, I hope. I'll be right eventually. <laughs> I will I be right eventually. You know, I said it's going to disappear. I'll say it again. But does it's that going to disappear. Does that discredit and I'll you? be right. I don't think so. Right. I don't think so. You know why it doesn't discredit? Because I've been right 
probably more than anybody else. Then there are masks. From the first day that the CDC said that people should wear masks on April 3rd, you said you weren't going to. You wore a mask for the first time in public at Walter Reed this weekend. Question, the CDC says if everybody wore a mask for four to six weeks, we could get this under control. Do you regret not wearing a mask in public from the start? And would you consider, will you consider a national mandate that people need to wear masks? No, I want people to have a certain freedom, and I don't believe in that, no. And I don't agree with the statement that if everybody wear a mask, everything disappears. Hey, Dr. Fauci said don't wear a mask. Our Surgeon General, terrific guy, said don't wear a mask. Everybody was saying don't wear a mask. All of a sudden, everybody's got to wear a mask. And as you know, masks cause problems, too. With that being said, I'm a believer in masks. I think masks are good. But uh, I leave it up to the governors. Many of the governors are changing. They're more mask into. They like the concept of masks. But some of them don't agree. I do say this. Schools have to open. Young people have to go to school. And there's problems when you don't go to school, too. And there's going to be a funding problem because we're not going to fund when they don't open their schools. We're not going to fund them. We're not going to give them money if they're not going to school. If they don't open two points schools. on that. First of all, what the federal government gives is only is eight percent, ten percent. And you know what? Uh, that's a lot of money. And you're going to take them. You know where the money goes? It goes overwhelmingly to disadvantaged kids and children with disabilities. Let the schools. Why wouldn't you put, send more money so the schools Chris, would be safer? Let the schools open. Did you ever see the statistics on young people below the age of 18? The state of New Jersey had thousands of deaths. Of all of these thousands, one person below the age of 18 in the entire state. One person. And that was a person that had, I believe he said diabetes. One person below the age of 18 died in the state of New Jersey during all of this. You know, they had a hard time and they're doing very well now. So that's it. The stimulus bill is running out the end of this month. Yeah. Uh, the Republicans say they want liability limits which the Democrats don't like. You say that you want a payroll tax cut, which even some Republicans are cool to. Well, a lot of Republicans like it. Though, you know. Will you only sign a bill that has those two provisions? Well, we're going to see, but we do need protections because businesses are going to get sued just because somebody walked in. You don't know where this virus comes from. They'll sit down at a restaurant. They'll sue the restaurant. The guy's out of business. Right. So we do need some kind of a, a you know, immunity. You do need it, just like you need immunity for the police, okay? Whether they like it or not, you need immunity for the police. But they do need a form of immunity. You don't know if they caught it, and nobody's ever going to be able to prove it one way or the other. You can't put these, you know, the people out. Look, the Democrats don't want to do that because they're, total, they're totally captured by the lobby of lawyers. The lawyer's lobby is probably right. the most powerful in the country. What about the payroll tax cut? Uh, I want to see it. I want to see and it. And if it's it isn't in the thing. bill? Uh, I'll have to see. But, yeah, I would consider not signing it if we don't have a payroll tax cut, yes. Hot enough for you here, Mr. President? It's hot. It's about, uh, well, sort of almost record-breaking You know, stuff. we wanted to do it inside. This was your choice. But I wanted you to sweat a little bit. <laughs> well, we both are. There has been a spike in violent crime in America in recent weeks. We've seen deaths up in New York, deaths up in Chicago, shootings. How do you explain it, and what are you going to do about it? I explain it very simply by saying they're Democrat-run cities. They're liberally run. They're stupidly run. We have uh, forced them in Seattle to end the chop because, you know, we were going in that following day. You probably have heard it. We were getting ready to go in. We were all set. And when they heard that we were going, they set their police force. Liberal Democrats have been running cities in this country for decades. Poorly. Why is it so bad right now? Uh, they've run them poorly. It was always bad, but now it's gotten totally out of control. And it's really because they wanted to fund the police. And Biden wants to fund, to fund no, he, the police. Sir, he does not. Look, he signed a charter with Bernie Sanders. I will get that one, just like I was right on the mortality rate. Did you read the charter that he agreed to? It says to nothing with, about defunding the oh, police. Oh, really? It says abolish. It says a fund. Let's go. All right. Get well, me, you, get you, me the charter, please. All right. Chris, you've got to start studying for these. He interviews. says defund the police. He says, defund the police. They talk about abolishing the police. They talk about illegal I, I, I aliens look, I look pouring. Forward, I look forward to seeing that. Meanwhile, the George Floyd murder has reignited 
the issue of racism in policing in this country. I want to give you a couple of statistics. Nationwide, blacks are twice as likely, fewer in absolute numbers, but in terms of per capita, blacks are twice as likely to be shot and killed by police as whites are. In Minneapolis, over the last five years, police use force against blacks at a rate seven times that against whites. Can you understand why blacks would be angry at that? Of course I do. I, of course I do. Many whites are killed also. You I have to say that. that. I mean, many, many whites are killed. I hate the sound, but this is going on for decades. This is going on for a long time, long before I got here. You know, if you look at what's gone on in Portland, those are anarchists, and we've taken a very tough stand. If we didn't take a stand in Portland, you know, we've arrested many of these leaders. If we didn't take that stand, right now you would have a problem like, you know, you, they were going to lose Portland. So let's see okay, what this says see. here. Prosecution, sanctuary cities, incentivize illegal alien, expand asylum, abolish immigration detention. No, I, That's not well, abolish. No, I, I, well, fine. Okay. This thing is many pages but, long. Fine. End prosecution of illegal border crosses. Support deathly, and these are the worst things. Sir, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you on any of those. I'm disagreeing about defund police. Incent the White House never sent us evidence the Bernie Biden platform calls for defunding or abolishing police because there is none. It calls for increased funding for police departments that meet certain standards. Biden has called for redirecting some police funding for related programs like mental health counseling. This week, you said that Black Lives Matter and the Confederate flag are both matters, issues of freedom of speech. Yeah. But in the case of the Confederate flag, there are a lot of people who say these were traitors who split from this country, fought this country in large part to preserve slavery. Is the Confederate flag offensive? It depends on who you're talking about, when you're talking about. When people proudly had their Confederate flags, they're not talking about racism. They love their flag. It represents the South. They like the South. People right now like the South. I say it's freedom of, of many things, but it's freedom of speech. So you're not offended by it? Well, I'm not offended either by Black Lives Matter. That's freedom of speech. Let me, and, let me, and you know, the whole thing with cancel culture, we can't cancel our whole history. We can't forget that the North and the South fought. We have to remember that, otherwise we'll end up fighting again. You can't, you can't just cancel all but, of but it. But let me ask you this when it gets to be more than just cancel, well, maybe this is cancel culture. The National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, you have threatened to veto it because in the bill, and this is supported by Republicans as well as Democrats, it would rename army bases named for Confederate generals. Now, this is a bill that funds military operations. It gives soldiers a pay raise yeah. you're gonna veto no, that because they'll get their pay raise hey look don't tell me this i got soldiers the biggest pay raises in the history of our understood of our military i got soldiers brand new equipment brand new jets brand new rockets brand new 2.5 trillion i did more for the military than any president that's ever had this you're office veto this because bill? i think that fort bragg fort robert and lee all of these forts that have been named that way for it's a long time, decades and decades. But the military and says they're excuse for me. this. Excuse me. I don't care what the military says. I do. I'm, I'm supposed to make the decision. Fort Bragg is a big deal. We won two world wars. Nobody even knows General Bragg. We won two world wars. Go to that community where Fort Bragg is in a great state. I love that state. Go to go to the community. Say, how do you like the idea of renaming Fort Bragg? And then what are we going to name it? You're going to name it after the Reverend Al Sharpton? What are you going to name it, Chris? Tell me what you're going to name it. So there's a whole thing here. We won two world wars, two world wars, beautiful world wars that were vicious and horrible. And we won them out of Fort Bragg. We won them out of all of these forts that now they want to throw those names away. And no, I'm against that. And you know what? Most other people are. And I even, I don't believe in polls because I see the fakest polls I've ever seen. But that poll is a 64% thing, which actually surprised me. We won world wars out of these, out of these military bases. No, I'm not going to go changing them. I'm not going to so go you'll changing veto. them. I might. Yeah, I might. At Mount Rushmore on July 3rd, you said that we face a far left fascism in this country. And then you said this. Our children are taught in school to hate their own country. 
and to believe that the men and women who built it were not heroes, but that were villains. You said our children are taught in school to hate our country. Where do you see that? I just look at, I look at school, I watch, I read, look at the stuff. Now they want to change. If 1492, Columbus discovered America. You know, we grew up, you grew up, we all did, that's what we learned. Now they want to make it the 1619 Project. Where did that come from? What does it represent? I don't even know. It's so slavery. I, that's what they're saying, but they don't even know. They just want to make a change. Cancel culture. I hate the term, actually, but I use but, but it. But are they teaching Cancel people culture. to hate America? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Look at the professors. Look at what's going on in the colleges. If a conservative goes on a college, and look, we have as many as them. Excuse me. I think, to the best of my knowledge, we're sitting at the White House, and the Oval Office is right behind me. We have as many as them. But Who, who's them? The liberal, radical left. And I'm not talking all I think liberal. I, I could tell you I like a lot of liberal people. I like a lot of liberal governors and senators. But, but Chris, we have a radical left destructive ideology and it's being taught in our schools. And don't act like you're surprised to hear this. There are books written about it. And we can't let that go on. We can't let them change the true meaning of what we're all about. And that's what they're trying to do, and I don't want it to happen. Not on my watch. It's not going to happen on my watch. Mr. President, you'll be happy to know that Fox News has a new poll out today, and you're going to be the very first person to hear about it. In the national horse race, Joe Biden leads you by eight points, 49% to 41. That's, I think, three, four points slimmer than it was a, a month ago. And on the issues, people trust Biden more to handle the coronavirus by 17 points, on race relations by 21 points, and even on the economy, they trust Biden more by one point. I understand we still have more than 100 days to this election, but at this point, you're losing. First of all, I'm not losing because those are fake polls. They were fake in 2016, and now they're even more fake. The polls were much worse in 2016. They interviewed 22 percent Republican. Well, how do you do 22 percent Republican? You see what's going on. Uh, I have other polls that put me leading, and we have polls where I'm leading. I have a poll where we're leading in every swing state, and I don't believe that you're... I, first of all, the Fox polls, whoever does your Fox polls, they're among the worst. They got it all wrong in 2016. They've been wrong on every poll I've ever seen. I, I, I must tell you. No, I'm just telling you. And, and let, me, let me ask you this. So on the economy, so I've always led on the economy. By a lot. I know, which is why I was Biden surprised by this Biden can't put number. two sentences together. They wheel him out. He goes up. He repeats. He, they ask him questions. He reads a teleprompter. And then he goes back into his basement. You tell me the American people want to have that in an age where we're in trouble with other nations that are looking to do numbers on us. So let me ask you a direct question. No, no I'm going to ask you a direct question about Joe that. Biden. Is Joe Biden senile? I don't want to say that. I say he's not competent to be president. To be president, you have to be sharp and tough and so many other things. They, he doesn't even come out of his basement. They think, oh, this is a great campaign. So he goes in. I'll then make a speech. It'll be a great speech. And some young guys start writing. Pre Vice President Biden said this, 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 this. He didn't say it. Joe doesn't know he's alive, OK? He doesn't know he's alive. Do the American people want that? Number one. Number two. I built the greatest economy ever built anywhere in the world, not only in this country, anywhere in the world, until we got hit with the China virus. We got hit with a virus, shouldn't have happened. And we had to close up. We saved millions of lives. Now we've opened it up. Got to go back to school. We're open. We got to do things. We had the best job numbers we've ever had last month. We should have good ones coming up in two weeks. Look, I built the greatest economy in history. I'm now doing it again. You see the numbers. The numbers are through the roof. Okay. The Democrats are purposely keeping their schools closed, keeping their states closed. I called Michigan. I want to have a big rally in Michigan. Do you know we're not allowed to have a rally in Michigan? Do you know we're not allowed to have a rally in Minnesota? Do you know we're not allowed to have a rally in uh, Nevada? We're not allowed to have rallies well, in these Democrat-run states. Oh, some people would say that that's a health risk, Some sir. people would say, would, fine. But I, mean, we, but I guarantee you, we had you, some issues after Tulsa. If everything was gone 100%, they still wouldn't allow it. They're not allowing me to do it. So they're not, they're, they're not allowing me to have rallies. But i got to tell you, if way. I may, sir, respectfully, yes. in the Fox poll, they asked people, who is more competent? Who's got, whose mind is sounder? 
Iden beats you in that. Well, I tell you what, uh, let's take a test. Let's take a test right now. Let's go down. Joe and I will take a test. Let him take the same test that I took. Incidentally, I took the test too when I heard that you passed it. Yeah, how did it's you do? It? Well, it's not the hardest test. No, but the it last. It has a picture and it says, the last, what's that? And it's an elephant. No, no, no. You see, that's all misrepresentation. Well, that's what it was on the web. It's all misrepresentation. Because, yes, the first few questions are easy. But I'll bet you couldn't even answer the last five questions. I'll bet you couldn't. They get very hard, the last five well, questions. Well, one of them was count back from 100 by 7. And let me tell you. You three. couldn't answer. You couldn't answer. All right, what's the question? Many of the questions. I'd get you the test. I'd like to give it. But right. I guarantee you that Joe Biden could not answer those questions. Okay. okay? Uh, you, and you I answered about, all 35 questions correctly. You, you talk about how you're winning, campaign's going well. Why did you replace Brad Parscale? Isn't that Because he's a great uh, digital guy. Uh, we all like him a lot. But I have somebody that I that was involved. You know, they're all they were all on the 2016 campaign, right. and we have Corey, and we have all the people. And actually, Steve Bannon's been much better not being involved. He says the greatest president ever. I mean, he's saying things that I said. Let's keep Steve out there. He's doing a good job. But they're all being they're all involved. If Joe Biden got in, first of all, he won't call the shots. The people, the radical left people that surround him, will call. Religion will be gone. Okay. Life, you could forget about that, the whole question of life. Supreme you, you, when Court, you say life, you mean abortion? Absolutely, 100%. That whole question, which is a very, you know, it's always been a 50-50 thing. It's actually trending a little bit more toward one side. When you side say religion is going to be gone, what does that mean? Look at what they're doing to the churches. They won't let the churches even open if they want to stand in a field six feet apart. We've had churches that wanted to stand in fields six feet apart. There has yep. never been an administration that's done so much as I have, from tax cuts to regulation cuts to rebuilding the military to getting choice for the vets. Nobody's done the things I've done. Nobody. In three and a half years, no other president's been able to do what I've done. You're running in large part on the economy. You built it once. Now we have the coronavirus. You're going to build it again. And in fact, you had great jobs numbers in May. You had solid jobs numbers in June. But I want you to look at some projections. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office says the unemployment rate at the end of the year will be 10.5%. J.P. Morgan says in the fourth quarter, GDP will contract by 6.2%. With states now rolling back some of the reopening and, 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 well, there are a lot of One Republican, purpose. there are a lot of Republican states that there are doing it, like no Texas, reason, uh, but here's, here's they'll be just, open very let soon. me just ask my question. There's no reason for Isn't California to, do, to be doing what they're doing. All right. But, except for November 3rd. With the states shutting back the reopening in a lot of clay, cases, new lockdowns, won't the economy still be a problem for you on election? I don't think so. I think the economy is expanding and growing beautifully. Now, the Democrats want to keep it closed as long as possible because they think that's good for election. But I think the economy is doing very well. Now we're coming back, and we're coming back at a level that nobody would have thought possible. And we, and by the way, take a look at another, I mean, a gauge, whether you like it or not, the stock market. The stock market, NASDAQ, hit its all-time high two weeks ago, and it's beaten it 14 different times, okay? Uh, the stock market, Dow, etc., is a thousand points away from its all-time high, meaning very close. We're going to have a stock market, perhaps, on November 3rd, that's the highest in history. I want to talk to you about Obamacare. Since the pandemic hit, millions of people have lost their jobs and thereby lost their health insurance, and almost a half a million have signed up for Obamacare. Your administration just announced that you're signing on to a lawsuit to overturn Obamacare. And replace it. Why does it make sense to overturn Obamacare, me, with no which way. people now are re re relying on? Democrats are going to say, the man who's wanted to kill Obamacare is going to take away your, the protection for pre-existing conditions. First of all, we got rid of the individual mandate. Pre-existing conditions will always be taken care of by me and Republicans, 100%. But you've been in office three and a half years. You, you don't have a plan. Well, we haven't had, uh, excuse me, you heard me yesterday. We're signing a health care plan within two weeks, a full and complete health care plan that the Supreme Court decision on DACA gave me the right to do. So we're going to solve, we're going to sign an immigration plan, a health care plan, and various other plans. And nobody will have done what I'm doing in the next four weeks. 
The Supreme Court gave the President of the United States powers that nobody thought the President had by approving, by doing what they did, their decision on DACA. And DACA is going to be taken care of also. But we're getting rid of it because we're going to replace it with something much better. But we got rid of already, which was most of Obamacare, the individual mandate. And that I've already won on. And we won also on the Supreme Court. But the decision by the Supreme Court on DACA allows me to do things on immigration, on health care, on other things that we've never done before. And you're going to find it to be a very exciting two weeks. Your niece, Mary Trump, has written a book about you and your family. And one of her main points is that she says your dad, Fred Trump Sr., damaged the whole family. And here's what she says about what you learned from your father. He learned to become the killer, you mentioned, um, the man who needs to succeed at all costs, who will do anything um, to get attention, financial rewards, and to win. Do you see any truth in that? My father liked to win. My father was a very good man. He was a strong man. It's disgraceful that she said that. She was not exactly a family favorite. We didn't have a lot of respect or like for her. I would have never said that, except she writes a book that's so stupid and so vicious, and it's a lie. My father was a great, wonderful man. Let me just ask you this but question. This is not a person that I spent very much time with, very little time, and now I'm glad. You've developed a pretty thick skin yeah. over the years, from decades of attacks in New York tabloids, now from the press here yeah. and your political opponents here in Washington. But even for Donald Trump, does it hurt you at all to be attacked in such personal terms yeah. by a member of your own family? Uh, it hurts me more about attacking my father, uh, not being kind to my mother. I have a mother who was like a saint. She was incredible. She was an incredible woman. And she was nasty even to my mother. She's a very scarred person. She was not much of a family person. But look, let me just tell you, my father was, I think he was the most solid person I've ever met. And he was a very good person. He was a very, very good person. He was strong, but he was good. For her to say the kind of things, a psychopath, that he was a psychopath? Anybody that knew Fred Trump would call him a psychopath? And you know what? If he was, I would tell you. And I would say, you know, Chris, I was with my father and it was impossible. My father was, he was tough. He was tough on me. He was tough on all of the kids, but tough in a, in a solid sense, in a really good sense. For her to say, I think the word she used was psychopath. What a disgrace. She ought to be ashamed of herself. That book is a lie. Some people were surprised when you agreed to this interview to sit down with me. What are you going to ask? Especially because of some of the mean tweets that you've said about me. Mike Wallace wannabe, nasty and obnoxious. I will tell you, after that one, my son Peter, whom you've met, called and he said, nasty, no, obnoxious, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the question. One of your beefs seems to be that I put Democrats on the show and I ask them questions. And, and I guess the question I have is, don't you understand it's my job to put Democrats on as well as Republicans and to ask them probing questions just like I asked Republicans? I'm not a big fan of Fox, I'll be honest with you. They've changed a lot since Roger Ailes. And I watch people like Swalwell, who I don't even know. He goes on the show. He got less than 1%. All of a sudden, he's on being interviewed for endless... Yeah, hours. but I, I interviewed Nancy... Him. Wait, I, I interviewed the Nancy... I I answer... I uh, interviewed... You sent one tweet after I interviewed Nancy Pelosi. And in the interview, I asked her specifically about the fact in February you were in Chinatown pitching tourism while the virus was spreading. If the president underplayed the threat in the early days, Speaker Pelosi, didn't you as well? Isn't that legitimate to talk to the Speaker that, of the House? Look, I know you very well. I respect you a lot. I respect your father a lot. I thought he was one of the most talented journalists there are. And you likewise are a very talented person. I do think this, I think you are very, uh, uh, I think you are toward the Democrat side, which is okay. I mean, it, it's okay. It's not true. Watch the James Comey interview I did in December. 17 significant errors in the FISA process, and you say that it was handled in a thoughtful and appropriate way. 
Yeah, he's right, I was wrong. But you make it sound like you're a, a, a bystander, an eyewitness. You were the director of the FBI while a lot of this was going on, sir. Sure. I'm responsible for that. That's why I'm telling you, I was wrong. I was overconfident as director in our procedures. You couldn't do as tough an interview with Comey. Okay. I, I'm, I, I'd like to think I treat everybody the same. It just seems to me that you are very prone to be nice to the Democrats, and maybe I'm wrong about that, Chris, but it's an honor to it, be with you. It's fine. I love it. I love it that it's close to 100 degrees. Out <laughs> your choice again. Yeah, I know. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not saying you're going to lose. I am not saying that. We saw how you turned it around last time. I don't think I'm going to lose at all. But if you did, how crushing would it be? To First you? of all, let me just tell you something. I know everyone wants to know that because they'd love to see me lose finally. I, I'm not, I have not you saying that at all. You know I've been written off? Do you know how many times I've been I, it off? I, I've done some of it myself, My sir. Whole I'm not life. doing it this time. Don't do not do it because... But how crushing would it be? And you know why I won't lose? Because the country, in the end, they're not going to have a man who who's shot. He's shot. He's mentally shot. Let him come out of his basement, go around. I'll make four or five speeches a day. I'll be interviewed by you. I'll be interviewed by the worst killers that hate my, my guts. They hate my guts. There's nothing they can ask me that I won't give them a proper answer to. Some people will like it, some people won't like I it. I agree with that. But look, you let, answer the let questions. Biden sit through an interview like this. He'll be on the ground crying for mommy. He'll say, <laughs> mommy, mommy, please take me home. Well, we've asked him for an interview, sir. He can't do an interview, he's incompetent. There's a number you don't mention. It's called the enthusiasm number. The enthusiasm for Trump is through the roof. I, even I higher, have mentioned it. Even higher than last time. The enthusiasm for Biden is non-existent. Everyone knows he's shot. But the shot. enthusiasm against you is Well, that's is okay. High. That's his only shot. I right. Mean, that's his only shot. I agree. And those people know I'm doing a good job, but there's something in my personality that they don't like. Because, look, nobody's done what I've done. Biden wants to come in and ruin our country, triple your taxes. He wants to do things. He wants to add regulations that I've all cut. And we still have regulation, a lot of regulation, but I've cut it down to a level that nobody's, nobody ever thought possible. He will destroy this country, but it won't be him. It will be the radical left. The same type ideology that took over Venezuela, one of the co richest countries in the world, they now have no water, they have no food, and they have no medicine. Two, That's gonna happen two here final, two final questions. if he wins. In general, not talking about November, are you a good loser? I'm not a good loser. I don't like to lose. I don't lose too often. I don't like to lose. But are you gracious? You don't know until you see. It depends. I think mail-in voting is, is going to rig the election. I really do. Uh, are you suggesting that you might not accept the results of the election? I, I have to see. Look, Hillary Clinton asked me the same thing. No, I asked you the same no, no, thing in the debate. There is a tradition in this country, in fact, one of the prides of this country, is the peaceful transition of power and that no matter how hard fought a campaign is, that at the end of the campaign, that the loser concedes to the winner, not saying that you're necessarily going to be the loser or the winner, but that the loser concedes to the winner and that the country comes together in part for the good of the country. Are you saying you're not prepared now to commit to that principle? What I'm saying principle? is that I will tell you at the time. I'll keep you in suspense. Well, okay? Chris. And you know what? She's the one that never accepted I it. I agree. She never accepted her loss. And but she it, looks like can a you fool. Give a, can you give a direct answer? You will accept the election? I have to see. Look, you, I have to see. No, oh, I'm not going to just say yes. I'm not going to say no. And I didn't last time either. Whether it's in 2021 or 2025, how will you regard your years as president of the United States? I think I was very unfairly treated. Uh, from before I even won, I was under investigation by a bunch of thieves, crooks. It was an illegal investigation. But what about the, Russia, good, Russia, what about Russia. the good parts there? No, no, I want to go this. I have done more than any president in history in the first three and a half years, and I've done it suffering through investigations where people have been, General Flynn, where people have been so unfairly treated. The Russia hoax, it was all a hoax. The Mueller scam, it was all a scam. It was all false. I made a bad decision on one bad decision, Jeff Sessions, and now I feel good because he lost overwhelmingly in the great state of Alabama. Here's the bottom line. I've been very unfairly treated, and I don't say that as paranoid. I've been very, everybody says it. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens, but with tremendous evidence right now as to how unfairly treated I was. President Obama and Biden spied on my campaign. It's never happened in history. If it were the other way around, 
The people would be in jail for 50 years right now. That would be Comey, that would be Brennan, that would be all of this, the two lovers, Strzok and Page. They would be in jail now for many, many years. They would be in jail, it would have started two years ago and they'd be there for 50 years. The fact is, they illegally spied on my campaign. Let's see what happens. Despite that, I did more than any president in history in the first three and a half years. Mr. President, thank you. Thanks thank for you. talking with us. Thank you. Thank you very much.